What is up, wrestling fans? Welcome to another episode of the Smart Guy Moment Smack Talk Podcast. I am your host as always, Tony Mango, and joining me as always are Robert E. Felice. Hey, hey. And Callum Wiggins. Hello. So, in preparation for Money in the Bank coming up, we're going to talk about Hell in a Cell. <laughs> because <laughs> we got taken by surprise a uh, couple days ago when they announced that instead of Money in the Bank coming after WrestleMania, the way that we have been having this happen for the past couple of years, October's pay-per-view of Hell in a Cell is being moved up. And it seems like predominantly the reason why is because that would be an easier way to just sort of not have to worry about what venue you would have the Hell in a Cell cage in or something, or maybe they have some specific plans about what they really, really wanted to do Hell in a Cell for, and they just decided Extreme Rules doesn't work in a better environment. I don't know. We'll find out some more information about that down the line, but that's not what we're talking about today. We're actually spinning that off into something that when we were trying to think of what to do, uh, Callum has suggested about, what about a top rope list when it comes to this? And we're going to be talking about today, if you could tell by the title and the thumbnail and everything that goes along with that, is we're going to try to figure out our consolidated list of the top 10 Hell in a Cell superstars. So what this pretty much means is the only people that we can put on this list are people who have competed inside WWE Hell in a Cell. It's not any other kind of cage uh, matches. It's not the same Hell in a Cell type of structure in another company. Um, it's just a list of I think it's about like maybe 20 something, I don't know, maybe 30 people or so at this point. I'm not exactly sure how many people uh, I didn't bother to make the whole big list. But, you know, we've gotten people from Alberto Del Rio all the way through Xavier Woods. So we've got a list of people to pick from. And even though there's not the biggest amount of people to pick from, it still might end up leading to some interesting discussion when it comes to the placement of the people, because the top 10 we have to figure out not only what our rankings are, but the way that we do these top rope lists. And that's what gives it a little bit of extra flair is when we go through and we decide on our own individual lists, we then have to consolidate. And it's kind of the same thing as what we do with like the Mount Rushmore or with any of the other kind of debate systems that we have going on here, where we're going to go through one by one and then we're going to kind of do the two to one vote and determine who gets placed where. So this is something that um, the essential setup is we're going to go one by one here, talk about our number 10, our number nine, number eight, so on and so forth. And if we reach a, a name that somebody has like four spots above hand at the very least, if not a big, big difference, then we're going to do a little rest hold on that one. We're going to hold off on that discussion until we get to the highest mark that that person's on. So just to spit out a name that's not going to be on this list because it's a different type of a thing. When we had the NXT all-time list, I had, for instance, uh, the Revival at number nine. And Callum had the Revival at number one. So when I had gotten around and I said, Keith Lee's my number 10, the revival is my number nine. Then it was like, oh, rest hold. Okay. And then we came back around to it eventually around that number one spot. And that's how our discussion is going to go here. Of course, as always, we want to remind everybody to drop a comment below. Tell us your thoughts on what your list would be, what you think our rankings are, and how you would kind of consolidate that when it comes to those things. When you're listening to this, make sure you hit that subscribe button if you haven't done that already. Ring that little notification bell as well to get those email alerts. Hit that thumbs up button and like the video. Hit the applause button if you want to help out and buy us a cup of coffee or toss some spare change our way. There's also the share button if you got anybody who you think would be interested in checking this out. And there is the join button, which is the same thing as the Patreon. And if you have seen that notification of what the most recent episode was, members only on the YouTube side of things and the people that are on the dark cast here on Patreon have access now to the WWE In Your House 5 or In Your House Seasons Beatings watch along that Rob and I did the other night. We just kind of felt like, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I think we ended at <laughs> around like 2.50 or something. <laughs> yeah, and that was a good time. Yeah, we just had some fun to do a fan ounce table on a whim. We talked about Mabel. 
Yeah. Mabel's in a match, a casket match against Undertaker in that one. We got some Bret Hart action, some Owen Hart action. We got Diesel. We got uh, Nature Boy Buddy. Uh, what was his name? Buddy Landell. Uh, you know, it, it's a fun time. So if you want to check them out, you got to check out the members only YouTube membership or the Patreon. And whatever you do in that regard is greatly, greatly appreciated because it helps support the channel and the website helps keep my motivation up and helps make sure that we do more and better content in the future. So if you got the buck and you want to help out and you think we're worth the money, and I think that we are, then, you know, send it our way and you've got my forever thanks for it. Uh, as far as plugs go, we'll come back to them a little bit later on. But the um, the setup here, we're doing the... NXT stuff is out of the way. We're going to move over to the Hell in a Cell on my spreadsheet. Let me make sure that I get that right information up so I'm not reading the NXT one anymore. And our top 10 lists that we've got going on here. Um, I found it a little bit difficult to get a top 10 out of this that I felt were a strong top 10. So I think that we're going to have some alterations on like the bottom halves. Were you guys able to get your lists pretty easily, or do you think that you struggled a little bit with the bottom half? Or maybe the whole thing, too. I think there's a definitive number of people in the top side of things. And then it kind of falls off, because there aren't that many people that have been in multiple Hell in a Cell matches. And even the ones that have been in individual ones, there's only a couple of them that had really standout performances. And realistically, and I don't really want to just bury the entire concept of this in general, but Hell in a Cell hasn't really mean, meant anything since about 2009. So, yeah. So, so from that point onwards, it's just, it's an event that happens typically in every October or September or whatever every year. Now it's happening in, in June. But yeah, it's just it's just an event on the calendar rather than actually being the culmination of a big feud or something that feels very memorable, significant. Yeah, I would agree with that because filling out the first four names on my list, easy. Yeah. Then you immediately start getting into like, well, I don't know, because the concept has been watered down over the years. The, the quality of matches. So it, it becomes hard, you know? And there are, I counted, 48 people who have competed. So we're going to take the top uh, one-fifth of the competitors. And we might get some names on here that some people might just be like, you know what, I put them on there anyway because screw it, even if it's not on the list at all and everything. So that'll be interesting when we get to the bottom tens and stuff. Um, I will say my number 10 and I can very easily be swayed <laughs> on some of these things. My number 10 right now is Batista. He is my number nine, so I think that's close enough. We could probably... He's my, he's my nine as well. Yeah. Okay. All right, so um, some variety on that. Who do you guys have for... Uh, uh, let's talk about Batista then. Um before we round out number 10 for you guys. Uh, <laughs> I don't, off the top of my head, remember the two Hell in a Cell matches that Batista has been in. <laughs> well, I'll tell you right now, they were with Triple H and The Undertaker, and they were... That's right. The la I would argue The Undertaker one is the last to, like, really be bloody, and this right before they go PG. So the Undertaker one is special in that way. And the Triple H one is one of the last two in the original cell structure. And that, of course, it was 2005, so it is bloody, and it's everything you come to expect from Hell in a Cell. And on top of that, I think those are the those are top Hell in a Cell performers, and he beats both of them. So... Even though he's only had two, I had to have him on this list somewhere. Yeah, from a kayfabe perspective, he's beaten two guys who I'm pretty sure will be in everybody's least top half of this list. Yeah. And 
yeah, so the, the match against Triple H is, a, is an important one for just establishing him as a top guy because that was the third straight time that he defeated Triple H on pay-per-view for the World Heavyweight Championship. And so that pretty much... Because essentially people were thinking, OK, he's beaten Triple H twice, but now we're going into Hell in a Cell and it's the third time, so Triple H is going to win the title back because that's what Triple H always does. And no, Triple H puts him over for the third time. And so, OK, this guy's a big deal now. And Batista would continue to hold on to that championship until he was forced to relinquish it due to injury in early 2006. Hmm. And then we go on with the match with The Undertaker, which is, again, it's, I think it's the final real match of their rivalry, at least their initial rivalry, because th- th- I think they can get back into it around about when Batista turns heel in 2009, but this is the culmination of the main rivalry, and, and for the for the most part, Undertaker had won that feud because he won the match at WrestleMania, he, they did that draw at Backlash, Undertaker then won the Steel Cage match on SmackDown, where he immediately then loses the title to Edge cashing in, but then Batista comes back, they feud over the title a little bit more, Batista wins the title, and then he defends it against the Undertaker inside Hell in a Cell. Admittedly, it was because Edge interfered. But, yeah, it was a big moment for him to just draw the line under the Undertaker thing, really, and just say, OK, I was the, I mean, not the better person, but I was at an equal level with the Undertaker at that point. So I... Can totally be swayed to move him up to number nine. Um, who do you guys have at your number tens, Callum? Kurt Angle. I have Sasha Banks. Kurt Angle's not on my list. I have Sasha higher, and Kurt Angle's not on my list. I have Sasha Banks uh, higher as well. So then I'll put... Uh, Callum's got Kurt Angle. Rob's got Sasha Banks. I'm not going to reveal where my Sasha is yet, and Callum's not going to do either, but... Uh, we'll hold off on Sasha a little bit. Uh, so Kurt's not on either list of ours, but what um, makes you put him at number 10, Callum? Is it just because he's your favorite? No. Well, that would be that would be a reason for it, but it's he's only had one Hell in a Cell match. But in that one Hell in a Cell match, he defeated The Rock, Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Undertaker, Triple H, and Rikishi. That's the Armageddon Hell in a Cell match I was just telling you about the other day, Tony. Yeah. yeah, you took me by surprise when you were like, are they building up to an Armageddon Hell in a Cell? And I'm like, is this like WrestleMania Backlash? <laughs> we're doing like, oh, they're going to, next to make review is going to be um, Judgment Day Vengeance or something. Because <laughs> it got to a point with me where there were, there are only a few people that had multiple Hell in a Cell matches that I felt was either important enough or memorable or good enough that I'd even consider putting them on the list. And then I just re- went through the list of people that have had one Hell in a Cell, but it was a really good one. And so I was left with people like, well, there's some people, I won't name them just in case they turn up in the list later on, but there are some people that have only had one Hell in a Cell match that was really good. And admittedly, this Hell in a Cell match, it's crazy and it's insane. I wouldn't say it's like super high quality, but when you have that, that magnitude of star power in the match, then it just feels like a massive deal when you have Vincent Mann interfering with a and with a truck coming in trying to take the cell down and Rikishi falls off the cell onto a, a back of a, a pickup truck. But to have, to have that much volume of great superstars in it and Kurt Angle comes out of the win, at least from a kayfabe perspective, it's probably the most impressive Hell in a Cell win in history. So Might be able to I, make the case for that. Uh, for most likely probably to fit in the number 10 spot, but... Yeah, I wouldn't go... I certainly was not going to go any higher than that, but among the other people that I was considering putting into that uh, slot, I just felt that, that was the most impressive win. Like, as I say, from a cafe perspective. So then, since you guys have Batista at number nine, my number nine is CM Punk. Not my list. Not my list. Okay, so that's going to be our uh, potential debate here about CM Punk and Kurt Angle at number um, 10, depending on who Rob has, because then if Rob doesn't have either of those, Rob's got somebody that's not on either of our lists, essentially. Um, I put Punk in there because... He's had the fourth most amount of appearances and he's won. He he was in five and he won two out of the five. So it's not the, you know, a winning record, but, and this might just be one of those biases when it comes to, this was around the time that I really started hardcore writing about pro wrestling was the CM Punk and Ryback stuff. But 
I do remember that more. And so until you mentioned it, I'd forgotten that CM Punk has been in four of these. Five. The last thing. Okay, I know he, Taker. He was I know he was in Friday. that stupid five way match they did in a in a um like it was a dark match after Raw. Oh, did but did they ever like release that? I know there's footage out there of it, but I don't think there's anything. Not like a, a WWE produced thing. I think it's some sort of like fan camera footage of it. But so he was that match. It was was it was um it was uh Alberto de Rio. Jack Swagger, Dolph Ziggler, John Cena, and CM Punk. Right. Yeah, okay, so that was a dark match. His first one was Undertaker um, yeah. beating him for the championship. And then that dark match, then it was Del Rio, John Cena, and CM Punk. Then Punk and Ryback, then Punk, Ryback, and Paul Heyman. Not the best lineup, so I'd be totally no. fine with uh, bumping CM Punk off the list when it comes to that, but... Yeah, that, that's the main reason why I did it. Even though he's got the quantity, outside of the match with The Undertaker, I don't think he has the quality of those ones because I can't remember anything about the triple threat match. So, and I know Alberto Real wins, so that's clearly a bad thing as well. And seeing Punk takes the fall on that one. The match against Ryback is unmemorable. And I think that was, was that Ryback's first defeat? Might have been. Yeah. And so I think it was just a case of Ryback shouldn't have been in that match. I think the only reason he was in that match is because someone had gotten injured or someone who was meant to be facing Punk at some point was just out of the picture and so they decided, okay, we've got to put this guy's uh, getting over pretty quickly. Let's put him in the title match and this was the start of really killing Ryback's momentum. Not yeah. that I'm super upset about that considering what a dick he turned out to be, but that's, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Oh, uh, you voted happened. for him to retire, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Only when he's told me not to vote for it. Yeah, <laughs> and kept the thing on the poll. Yeah. I mean, but, you guys um, have very easily already persuaded me where I've already switched my list to Batista being above Punk. Because <laughs> it's like, ah, well, Batista won both of his matches and they were better. So Yeah. Yeah, and the other match we were right back and see uh right back seeing Punk and Paul Heyman is just Well, it's it's just the same match with a a guy who's not particularly good working with CM Punk. And you just had the pull the shot of him hitting Paul Heyman with a kendo stick on top of the cage. Yeah. Well, okay, it's a, it's a visual, but it's nothing super exciting. So then, Rob, sneaking ar around here, uh, what is your number eight? My number eight is Roman Reigns. I have him higher. I have him higher, but not not egregiously, so. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rest hold it. Okay. Uh, Callum, you're number eight. Randy Orton. I have him higher. I'm rest holding him. <laughs> yep, sure. My number eight is Sasha Banks. Oh, yeah. Rest hold oh, for good. her, too? Damn, yep. you're making me... Absolutely rest hold. I'm the Sasha stan of the three of us, <laughs> and I had her at number ten, damn. Ben's like, woo! <laughs> <She's good. laughs> <I know. laughs> um, okay, so then I'll sneak mine around. Now, my number seven is Kane. Not on my list. Ooh. Almost made my list, but I didn't put him. Ooh. Both. Not ha I mean, Kane, come on. The entrance alone. Kane, Kane <laughs> has one Hell in a Cell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. He has three Hell in a Cell matches. He has one Hell in a Cell match. Because those two ones, that one match happened on Raw, that Tornado Tag Team match. Is just a load of bullshit. It's, it's a closing segment. It's a closing five minutes, and the other one with mankind is okay, but there was a no contest. Yeah, your he's on your list because of the entrance. Because of the match that he's not even in. But he's in it. <laughs> no, he's not in it. He doesn't. He's not involved in it. This is Hell in a Cell competitors, not Hell in a Cell interferers. He's a competitor who's been in Hell in a Cell before, who happened to also make an appearance. <laughs> He's that had, entrance had, beats out, for instance, like Punk on my list. Like you know, although to be fair, you guys one, don't have Punky on your list either. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's, he's had one. He's had one legitimate Hell in a Cell match against the Undertaker, and admittedly, he did win that match. So, which is yeah. an impressive feat. But it's not. It's not enough for him to get on this list. I'm gonna make a case for at least number ten. 
I, I got you're not gonna get it. You're not gonna get it. <laughs> I'll make the case though. <laughs> I'll fight for it. Who's your number seven, Cal? Roman Reigns. I still have him higher. Okay. Really? Okay. Uh, Rob, your number seven. My number seven is John Cena. Not on my list. Not on my list. Oh, wow. I, I put John Cena on this list because I started thinking, like, oh, this is where you get into the spot of, well, who's been in there? And then you go, well, Cena's been in, you know, three of them that were high profile for his era. And I like his stuff against Randy. So I put him on the list. It's not like I don't have a deep, deep explanation. It's just he was in some of them. He's a big guy. So he's on there. <laughs> So then what's your number six, Rob? Brock Lesnar. Not on my list. Brock Lesnar as well is, is, is my number six. Thank you. Um, Brock Lesnar's... Listen, he's had two of them, but they're fucking great. And they're both against The Undertaker, and he won both of them. <laughs> and he wins both of them, because fucking Brock Lesnar's the man. Yeah, he's, he's only had two, but they were just absolute... They're two of my favorite Hell in a Cell matches of all time. Like, especially after... Because we went back and did it for a... Obviously, uh, Paul Heyman's SmackDown, the 2002, 2002, uh, 2003 uh, retro podcast we did. We did it, obviously, on the Patreon side of things. So if you want to check out our review of that, then definitely head over to the Patreon, uh, pledge your amount of money, and then you can get there. But, yeah, because they had the match at Unforgiven, which is one of just, is just such a huge disappointment, considering the two names involved. And then they come back to Hell in a Cell, and they just beat the shit out of each other, and they're bleeding all over the place. Undertaker, I think, bleeds as much as I've seen. There's only, like, a handful of wrestlers I've seen bleed more than the Undertaker bled in that match. Paul Heyman and, bleeds in that match? Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, and it's, just like, it's a real establishing moment for Lesnar in his, early on in his career. It's like he defended the WWE Championship against the Undertaker inside Hell in a Cell. It's like, okay, this guy's a real deal. And then they do the one in... It's 2016? 15. 15. Oh, it was 2015, okay. And, yeah, and I know they'd already had that match at SummerSlam as well with the bullshit finish of uh, Undertaker, like, cheating to get him in the... Uh, uh, Hell's Gate. Yeah, get the Hell's Gate after he tapped out to the Kimura. But then they have this really, again, a really fun match. And this is an Undertaker who... It's 2015. Undertaker is well past the peak at this point. That's not even his last Hell in a Cell match. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but he... Brock gets so much out of Undertaker in this match, and it's such a a well worked thing. It's so much better than the match at WrestleMania 30. It's better than the match they had at SummerSlam, even though that match was a better version of the previous one as well. And yeah, it was interesting to see Undertaker work that match semi heel, really, as well. I'm gonna have to go back and listen to some of the older podcasts because I'd be interested in what Tony was saying at the time because I think that's some of their best work together. Outside of the one Hell in a Cell in 02, that feud is easily the best thing they had ever done together program-wise. I don't know for sure, but I probably was so tunnel-visioned on just being sick and tired of the Lesnar stuff that I probably just missed and complained about that the whole time. I would imagine that's probably the case. I think that that was kind of firmly into that whole, like, I'm tired of writing up 90 articles about Brock Lesnar or something so I'm, that might have been, been like around the Brock Lesnar rule I don't know I don't remember when that started do you remember when that was no that, that came way later I came when I was on the podcast that was like uh, prior to crown jewel or something like, yeah that's like three years later <laughs> huh. yeah, maybe I wasn't so down on it then yeah I wasn't even on those things at that point I don't think but then again I, I, I don't do pay-per-view um, reviews anyway usually because time, time difference yeah but yeah, I'm just clicking on and seeing saying, so Hell in a Cell 2015 results, reviews, it was you, Payden, Wago, and Drew. So we know Drew's uh, response was, uh, it was a match. Mm. <laughs> yeah, Kane was on the show earlier as well, so you probably got excited. About he got that, a shot. But... You know. <laughs> so you guys have Lesnar at six. He's not on my list. My number six maybe should even go higher depending on the, the way that we're ranking this, and I could be definitely persuaded to put him up higher, is Mick Foley. Oh my god, he's way higher. Yeah, higher. Stop it. <laughs> okay, I'm very glad to hear that then. Um, so then I'm going to sneak back around here, and I'm going to say my number five was Roman Reigns. 
But okay. So the fact that that's already a, a thing, I am totally going to move that around, and I'm going to put McFoley above him. Roman Reigns being at number six, and McFoley being at number five. Okay. So My number five. Now that we got the uh, Roman Reigns things, all three of us have them on here. Let's talk about them. Um, okay. We've got eight for Rob, seven for Callum, and was five, but now six for me. Roman has been in four. He's won undefeated. three of them. Yeah, undefeated. One of them's uh, no contest. Yeah. Yeah, I hate the fact there's there's any no contests inside here. It really so. should not be the case. Yeah. There's no reason for that kind of... You know what? I mean, definitively... Hell in a Cell used to be, we've talked about this before, it used to be the go-to, that's the top possible gimmick you can do. Like, this blood feud has gotten so bad that we've done a street fight and we've done, uh, you know, in The Undertaker's cases, like, we've done a casket match and we've done this and we've done that. Hell in a Cell is the, I'm going to beat you until you're dead, basically, type of a match. And just by doing it as many times as they've done, that's why we get to where there's been 45 Hell in a Cell matches. And honestly, if you were to do the Sporkle quiz, I couldn't tell you probably half the people that have been in them without just starting to name names. Like Seth Rollins versus Bray Wyatt. I don't remember that off the top of my head. I know it happened, but I don't remember anything about it other than The Fiend. And I couldn't tell you a damn thing that happens in uh, Undertaker versus Shane McMahon other than the fall and the build up to it of the um, the lockbox bullshit, you know, Roman versus Rusev. I don't remember anything happening there. Kevin Owens versus Seth Rollins. That happened. <laughs> I don't know. Like, that's not a slight on the guys, too. Like Owens is fantastic. Seth Rollins is great, you know, but. It's just not, they don't feel the same anymore. And when you do a no contest and a thing that's supposed to be like that, Roman Reigns versus Braun Strowman ends just because of Brock. No. Like, uh, that's, it doesn't sit right with me. So, I will kind of yeah. ding that sort of a thing, but I can't deny the fact that Roman Reigns has won three out of four, you know? I I pretty much there just a mixture of the fact that he is undefeated and so he does do really has done really well. But also I I'm a big fan of the quality of his matches inside Hell in a Cell. I was a big fan of the Bray Wyatt one because that was before That's Bray Wyatt. That's a great match, dude. Yeah, before he became the Fiend, and they were they were in a decent feud, and actually Br Bray was winning a few of those matches as well, which is surprising. But yeah, they did some good stuff there. I really loved the match with Rusev. I thought that was an excellent match. It's more of it's a match that didn't really need the Hell in a Cell gimmick, but the fact that it's in there and it's still a great match is like really good. The match with Strowman is is just there and it ends with Lesnar interfering, so that's that's kind of like the big the, the black mark in his uh, name at the moment. But then the match with Jay Uso is like some people's calling it like one of the matches of the uh, in terms of like WWE one of the matches of the year from last year. That was a fun match to to watch go down. Yeah, it's a really good storytelling match. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that where I assume that Roman will have a match with I in my, in my mind I'm thinking he's having a match with Jimmy Uso at Hell in a Cell this year. Which makes me feel like it might just be exactly the same as the previous one, only slightly different mm -hmm. a slightly different tweak on the storytelling. But if it is at that, that, that level of quality, then yeah, they should be that then that should be another good one. Nice nice little tick to add to his box there. And yeah, I could see, I could see a situation where in a few years' time he's way way higher on this list. I could see that being the case. Yeah. So we're holding yeah. off on the Mick Foley discussion. Yes. Which I'm very happy to hold off on that and put him higher because Mick Foley's great. Mm -hmm. That uh, brings up a question though. When we talk about some of these things, we're around the mid range right now. Um, how do you rank people based off of? I guess this is going to be kind of something we factor into the Foley thing, so we might hold off a little bit of the discussion on this, but Hell in a Cell matches, we said, we don't like when there are no contests, because this should be a definitive end to a feud. We're not fans of when Hell in a Cell just happens to happen, and it's like, well, you know, it's October, or in this case, it's June, so I guess, like, like to me, Cesaro versus Roman Reigns, if that happens, 
where really at this point anybody versus Roman Reigns is not worthy of Hell in a Cell. And you put them in the cage, it just seems like it's a regular cage match. It should be a feud that's been going on for a long time. And another element that we don't get anymore is blood. Somebody accidentally gets busted open, that's a different story, but it used to be that that was a bloody match. And one of the most violent matches, and we don't get it anymore because now we're in an environment where, thankfully, for the most part, they're safer. But I am not a fan of Hell in a Cell matches where people get hit in the back with a chair and hit in the stomach with a chair and somebody brings a kendo stick out. And you're basically having the generic safe street fight that happens to be inside of a structure that blocks the audience from seeing it. Especially now, because it's fucking red. Oh, the red thing, too. I mean, that's another thing. But, yeah, like, how important is blood to you in ranking Very. this kind of Hell in a Cell situation? Very. It's one of the reasons why. I I think just overall, the name of the bottom of the list are on the bottom of the list, because their matches aren't as memorable, because it's not this great big buildup and then this bloody affair. It's... Well, it's October. Let's put him in the cell. And so blood means a lot to me. I can kind of... I think the blood is a big deal when you kind of just describe the idea of Hell in a Cell. That's what you'd expect from a giant cage where just any amount of inhuman violence can happen. I don't think it's vital. It doesn't really take me out of it that a lot of matches don't have it nowadays. It's more, to me, it's more the repetitive nature of the fact that it's like, it's a quote-unquote annual event as opposed to, and you see multiple versions of the same match on a card more than it, it's about the blood or anything along those lines. So if you want to make sure that you are using some kind of steel that's not going to be getting you all bloodied up, you might be interested in our sponsor. <laughs> And support for Smart Guy Moment is brought to you by Manscaped, the best in men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world, offering you precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Not going to be dicing you up like those steel structures that they have in WWE, and, you know, when the people rub their faces along the chain-link fence or something, you're not going to feel that down below, no, because you're going to use the Lawnmower 4.0 or any of the other products that they've got there. They've got the Weed Whacker, which we mentioned before, uh, they should have brought in the indies for that thing from the other day. And uh, if you want to take advantage of this sponsorship, then use the promo code SMARK at manscaped.com and you will get 20% off and free worldwide shipping with that code. It helps us out, it helps uh, Manscaped out, it helps you out because you end up getting some good stuff for uh, using this in the process. And We've been talking about this a little bit here and there. I mentioned before they've got their, what they call their advanced skin safe technology. So that's why you're not going to end up with those problems with your, uh, <laughs> your, your boys down there. Um, I've mentioned that I've tried on their, uh, even their t-shirt and their, uh, their boxers. So maybe you're not in the mood to get uh, some of the grooming stuff, but to be perfectly honest, this t-shirt is comfortable as all hell. <laughs> like, uh, I'm a big fan of that. So uh, I'm eventually going to be trying some of their other products. And I know that some other people have been picking some up and that they've been liking what they've got. Um, it's been a little while at this point. Uh, Callum, you've gotten a couple of their different products. Anything else you want to uh, spotlight? I mean, it's just, it, it's just, uh, it's fit for, fit for purpose. I like the fact that you, I think I mentioned it before in the previous podcast, but the little light is like, it's so, it's, it's so reassuring almost. <laughs> you have like something to just add a little bit more, um, just a bit more of a spotlight on it, just to make sure that if you were in any way nervous or anything like that, it just gives you constant flows of reassurance that everything's going to be okay because, and I've been working on this one, so bear with me. You don't want to botch around your crotch. <laughs> <laughs> it's then it's true you really wouldn't want to botch around your crotch and manscaped really does have the best tools for the job i've mentioned this before i had the lawnmower 3.0 it's you don't feel any kind of nerves when you're going to shave it's just 
easy peasy. It's good for the job. And I'm waiting for one of you to try the weed whacker because I think we're going to be in the market for a new uh, nose hair trimmer. And I think I might be picking up the weed whacker. And if you are a big fan of that light, remember, it's not going to be the same type of lighting that they had with Hell in a Cell and The Fiend. You're not going to get that red light all over the place where you can't see a damn thing. No, it's actually a light that works. So. <laughs> no, but red light would work for like lesser razors, so it could cover up all the blood. That's true. So don't buy the competition. Buy something from Manscaped.com. Use your promo code SMARK, S-M-A-R-K. Get your free shipping and your 20% off. So check that out. Thank you to Manscaped for sponsoring this. And keep in mind, everybody, that your balls will thank you, and so will we. Let's move things over to finishing out the rest of the number fives. I had Mick Foley that we're holding on fun. And Callum, who's your number five? Lost my list for a second there. Uh, Shawn Michaels. Uh, he's higher well, for me. Yeah. I'll say he's number four. He's he's four for me. I thought, yeah, he's four for me. So you know what? Let's uh let's talk about him then. Um, actually, uh, let's hold off. Who do you have for number five, Rob? Randy Orton. Randy Orton is higher on my list, but he's I'll just say it. He's my number three. He's higher than four. Oh, Tony, you need to switch Foley and Randy right now. It's just like that's just not right. I'm totally willing to do that. We'll have that discussion. <laughs> Callum, who's your number four? Sasha Banks. Sasha. Uh, so she was already on my number eight. Um, all right. So we got. Is Rob, uh, or Rob's got Randy Orton at number five. Callum, do you have Randy Orton on your list? Yeah, he's number eight. Oh, that's right. Okay. So we've got Orton and we got Michaels and we've got Sasha that we can bounce around with, you know, so. Sasha was lowest on Rob's. She was number 10, number eight on mine, and number four on Callum's. Uh, my basic thought process behind putting her at number eight, and this might have applied to Rob too, is that she just hasn't been a part of as many. But then again, uh, she's been a part of three. And she's lost two of them. So I couldn't rank her super duper high, but she is the highest and she's I'll spoil this. She's the only woman that's on my list. Well, yeah, she's the only woman that I think belongs on this list because she's been in all three and she's worked all three of the other four horsewomen. And the truth is, when you want somebody kind of like Sean back in the day, when you want somebody to set the pace for a match type, it's it's Sasha Banks. And why is she up to number four on yours, Callum? Because I think her standard has been impeccable in those matches. I feel like the weakest one of the three of them is the match with Charlotte, the first one. But it has the advantage of being the first one, so it's memorable in that regard. So it is a moment of history to have those two go up against each other. And realistically, that's a match that, due to the feud that they were having at the time, could have really demanded Hell in a Cell. And it probably should have ended the feud, but they decided to continue on because they had no other idea of what to do at that point in time than just Sasha against Charlotte. But it's a it's a good match, which is hurt by a few botches to do with tables and stuff like that. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Like, I would have put her higher, especially, like, over some of like, the John Cena's in the world. But I didn't want it to seem like I was just fanboying. So I said, she's at least number 10. Thinking, yeah. honestly, thinking I might be the only one to put her on the list. But, uh, yeah, I'm glad to see Sasha getting this love. Yeah, it, just the, the two matches between her and Becky Lynch and her and Bailey are two of the, I think, especially in the modern era, they're two of the best worked Hell in a Cell matches. They're just, they have the right balance of being just well worked in the ring and showing a lot of violence and animosity between the two of them. They're very innovative. And they're very creative with weapon spots. You can tell when she gets into this structure, she's thinking about everything she can do here. And she wants to always go into this match wanting to do something different than she did the time previously. And I feel like, considering the fact that, I know it's always the case, like she hasn't been in many Hell in a Cells. Well, actually, she's been in 100% of Hell in a Cells because there's only been three that have had women in it. So, <laughs> So it's almost like... It's a, it's a different ball game, really, when you talk about the women's side of things, because they have to start a lot later on than the men did. So she's realistically been 
in all Hell in a Cell matches that she's been eligible to be in. So I think that means that she can kind of bypass the fact that she hasn't been in as many as people like John Cena or Randy Orton or people like that. I just think that her overall standard or well, her hit rate in terms of great quality matches is a lot higher than a lot of the other guys that have been in this match multiple times. So I'm shuffling around my deck a little bit here. Um, I kind of, um, I, I bumped it to where instead now my Foley three Michaels for Randy Orton at five because I looked a little bit more into it and I'm changing my mind because... Yeah, you can change it on the fly with that stuff, which means that the next lowest would be Orton, because then there's eight, five, and five. Now, I had had him up higher because of his win record, five and three. But the more that I'm thinking about this list and the more that when you guys are arguing about, like, the quality of Sasha Banks' matches versus some of the other things, I'm ranking more so now based off of quality than I did before. And I'm going to, like, I I didn't see Randy Orton's matches for some of them. And the ones that I did see, if I remember correctly, I, I've liked what I've seen. But of course, I can't compare that to my fandom and my preference of Mick Foley and Shawn Michaels. So somebody like an Orton... Makes sense if he's higher. If anybody makes him on higher on the list, uh, you know, I can see that. But he had matches against John Cena, against The Undertaker, Sheamus, Mark Henry, Daniel Bryan, John Cena again, and Jeff Hardy and Drew McIntyre. So he has won the WWE Championship in one of these matches. He has had the um, the double scenario with John Cena where one of them he won, one of them he lost. He beat Sheamus to retain the championship, lost to Mark Henry, and he won the championship over Daniel Bryan in Hell in a Cell. He's got a good uh, track record for this. And he's the only competitor... To have competed in every iteration of Hell in a Cell. So he competed in the original, he competed in the the giant silver one, and he's competed in the Red Abomination. Yeah, I just... I haven't, I haven't ranked low, so low down, it's just because I don't find any of these matches particularly memorable. Um, like, the match with The Undertaker is a really good one. But that's The Undertaker that he's fighting, and that was when Randy Orton was young and hadn't been, you know, forced down your throats for about, like, 15 years at this point. So, uh, match with McIntyre is fine, but it's it's just, it feels like a match that happens all the time in this era of the Hell in a Cell. Match with Jeff Hardy is interesting just because he sticks that thing in Jeff's ear. Ooh. Oh. So, <laughs> yeah, that was... <laughs> And then he's got two matches with Cena, and I hate... I, I'm the complete opposite of Rob. I hate his matches with John Cena. They do absolutely nothing for me. And I I find it um, obnoxious to to think that that's considered, like, the big feud of the the, two, the 2000s or the early 2010s is him and versus John Cena, when I... At least from my perspective, they never had a good match against each other. Or never had a great match, should I say. They had good matches. They never had a great match against each other. I think I can agree with you about them not having, like, what we would consider great matches. But they did just about everything under the sun. And even with it being egregious in some ways, it's still so much better than a lot of what we get now. Where they kept swapping the title. You know, you had to actually watch because you didn't know who they were going to put over this week. As opposed to anything that we see now, but I'll agree with you in that they're not great Hell in a Cell matches, a lot of Brandy's. It's just that he's been in a lot of them, and when he's, as we said before, when he is motivated, he is pretty good, and I think the Undertaker match, he was motivated, the Jeff Hardy match, he was motivated, and I think the 2015 one with Cena, he was more motivated than anything else. I'm trying to look up my uh, initial reactions. 
on some of these, um, at least for the ones that I had written up something of some fashion on the website about, because uh, some of them, of course, they date back way past I was doing that. But the, I think it might be, so 2010 I've got, I think I've got 2009 maybe. Yeah, I've got 2009 in some fashion, and then that, that might be the last one with that one. According to my initial reactions, 2009, that was... Cena. Randy Orton against Cena. It was... <laughs> I'm just going to read these verbatim without even thinking about it at the time. Um, really, what the fuck is the purpose of all these short title reigns? It's annoying the hell out of me. This match was, like the rest of the card, bland. And I ask you, what during this match should I have been excited about? What was so great that I should talk about it here? If you can think of any answer, I'd like to know. <laughs> His 2010 was against Sheamus. And my reaction was, well, there goes the, that idea of the Miz cashing in. I wish this match was over already. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> I don't have high hopes for it. <laughs> Uh, average stuff so far, nothing really to point out. Stryker called him Randall. <laughs> That's about the first interesting thing. Orton slams Re Sheamus pretty hard on the steel steps, which looked good. Sheamus hits a bicycle kick, but Orton kicks out, thankfully. He then starts hitting Orton in the back with a chair. He misses another shot, and Orton, uh, Orton RKO's him, but Sheamus rolls out of the ring. Orton goes for the punt, but Sheamus moves out of the way and hits another bicycle kick. Orton kicks out again. Orton RKO's him on the steel steps and retains the title. The last two minutes or so were decent, but the rest of the match was boring. This is one of the reasons I don't like the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. It's a total waste of a Hell in a Cell match. This feud wasn't hot enough or important enough to warrant that gimmick, and they certainly didn't follow through with it by having a good enough match to change my opinion in retrospect. Uh, and then I complained about Orton wasting a ton of time climbing up the ladder to, or climbing up the cage to pose for a few minutes. Pointless seeing as how they can't bring the cage up when he's standing on it. I <laughs> wrote down... His next one was against Mark Henry. And I've got down Jim Morris. Says, uh, okay, this is play-by-play -play type stuff. Um, nothing really seeming like interesting in that. A bear hug, this, whatever, kicks out, something. Cole calls it a buzz kill. So then I eventually say, uneventful Hell in a Cell match, basically. That's the main reason I don't like why they have two of these a year. If you look, If you overlook that disappointment, it wasn't too bad. These aren't doing uh, too well on that. What's the next you one? You were more positive about Mark Henry than anything else. With the uh, Daniel Bryan one, it was meh. wasn't as good as I was hoping it would be. Not an immense letdown and a horrible end or anything, but I was hoping it would be much better than this. So not that it was okay, but disappointing. The Cena and Orton one from 2014 was much better than expected, and I'm very surprised there wasn't any kind of interference from Seth Rollins. So that's a positive one. Then there was the Randy Orton one from the Jeff Hardy one in 2018, which I had said, good spot with Hardy dangling from the cage and such. Not bad. And then the Drew McIntyre one of... Where's that on this list? Uh, I know there's Ali, happened. Ali versus Randy Orton in 2019. Well, why do I have that he down? Didn't he didn't fight he's not a Hell in a Cell match, is it? Yeah, he's not in a Hell in a Cell match. A Hell in a Cell. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't in a Hell in a Cell. That, that 2019 was the themed and Bray Wyatt. The, yeah, the themed Bray Wyatt. And and so then I don't uh, have any kind of thing for written down for the that match because that was well, on. It, um... it just happened. So as you know, you'll know what he thinks because go back and listen to the podcast. Yeah, then I got to find the the 20, uh, 2021. <laughs> I'm, uh, forgot to bring that one up. And I'm like, that really confused me right then. I'm like, Ali versus what? Okay. So the 2021 was boo who is there on raw for orton to fight over the coming months there aren't a lot of baby faces i don't want to see mcintyre versus orton anymore for instance i think this was a mistake as great as orton has been this year it should have been mcintyre retaining to feud with tons of people including a match against reigns at survivor series so i was mad at the outcome but didn't mention anything about the match so orton's not you know yeah i fully admit I'm happy now that I bumped Orton down past uh, Michaels and Foley. <laughs> so then let's talk about Michaels because we've got two number fours and one number five. Fantastic first match. That's for sure. 
Shawn Michaels is the fucking man. And he's, he hasn't been in a lot of them, but he's been in ones that were always really good. Uh, what? I mean, he's been in a three on two handicap match into the man's and the big show. That's good for what it is. What absolute comedy and a complete abomination of what the hell in a cell should stand for. Yeah, but well, here we are 15 <laughs> years later, and they, they they killed it anyway. I'd agree with you if it like it had just happened. It was the only standout bad match, but they've had so much worse. I know they've had more boring matches since then, but it's just a case of at that time the Hell in a Cell meant something, and then the closing shot, well, one of the closing shots of that match is. Vince a man getting his head shoved up Big Show's ass, and that's yeah. like, yeah, and and this is and this is the 2006 version of DX, and I know some people like like the nostalgia of it, but there's in, if you're being like honest with yourself, there's really not much good things to say about the 2006 plus version of DX. Yeah, it's just two, it's just two middle-aged men trying to recapture their youth. It's like them both going through midlife crisis at the same time. And yeah, it's just, I mean, that's why I've got Michael's down at five because he, to me, he's got two great ones, which are the, obviously the first Hell in a Cell. Actually, I'm not, I don't even class the match with Triple H as a great one. I it's love that. Way, way, way too long. I, I think I that's really 45 like that. minutes. It does go 45 minutes. It's just like, okay. Uh, like completely shit on the fact that Chris Benoit is your world champion at this point in time. This is like, at this point, it's like, oh, Chris Benoit's in the match against Kane. Oh, I guess we don't actually care about him as world champion. Let's put these guys on the main event instead. And then you have the 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 match for the Big Show and and the McMahon's, and then the match with Legacy. And the Legacy one is interesting just because they'd put Legacy over in a previous on the previous pay per view, I believe. And I think this was a good a good showcase for them. I actually quite like the structure of the match where um, I think it's Triple H gets locked out and they're just beating up Michaels for ages and ages and ages. And then Triple H gets a um, bolt cutters, breaks his way in, and they eventually come back and win. But I think it was a really good showcase for the younger talent there. I don't think they were burying them in that regard. On the... I enjoyed that match a lot. Um, I'll just make this quick. Cause it was the first like, tag team Hell in a Cell, even though it ended up being a handicap scenario most of the time. And I really like the DX Legacy feud, but that first one, you almost can't top it all these years later. Mm -hmm. And the one with Triple H, I think, is a really final fight type of affair. And they never have a match on that scale ever again, so it truly was like the final thing that they really did as a feud. And I mean, he's even included as a referee in some of them. So like, he's linked to this cage pretty strongly. I was going to say, on the strength of the first one alone, that is enough of a reason for me to rank him at least in the mid-range, but I do remember enjoying, to an extent, the uh, Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase one, and I, of course, give him some bonus points when it comes to WrestleMania, Undertaker, Triple H, but he's the re special guest referee. So... I'm I'm thinking we're probably going to end up with Michael somewhere around that four or five range. That's that's where we we've got him right now. I'm almost certain Callum and I have the next three exactly like. Almost mm. certain. We'll see. So, I had said my number three was McFoley after I had shifted things around. My number three is also McFoley. Triple H. Triple H. Okay, so. Uh, I guess we'll kind of we'll balance it around uh not balance, we'll bounce it around like this. My number two is Triple H. My number two is also Triple H. Mick Foley. So we got Mick Foley, Triple H around there. And we all have number one is very clearly Becky Lynch. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Biggie. Um uh, no, And by the way, don't don't make any comments. I love Biggie, I love Becky Lynch. I'm not making fun of them. It's the Undertaker. Of course, it's the like I mean, come on, <laughs> was it like that was the one that is definitive? Of course, he's number one. Yeah. Uh, so the McFoley and Triple H thing, then. Um, Calum's got Foley above Triple H, and Rob and I have him at number two. Uh, here's where I 
make the argument Triple H above Mick Foley. Mick Foley, I would say, is somebody I consider more synonymous with it. But he's never won a single one. And he, I'm going to piggyback off that and say Triple H had was in almost all of them at one point. Before the pay-per-view creation, Triple H was in literally every Hell in a Cell that The Undertaker wasn't in. It was just Triple H and The Undertaker, that was their match. So. He's been in nine of them compared to Foley's four. And Triple H has won six of them. Foley's uh, three losses and one no contest. I, I think Triple H... Foley is more synonymous because of the moments. Yeah. But Triple H is the more prolific Hell in a Cell competitor. And you figure one of them is Triple H and Foley. Yeah. And he won that. So <laughs> it's kind of... Technically speaking, you do the whole thing. It wasn't Mick Foley. It was Mankind. It was Cactus Jack, that sort of thing. It's Mick Foley. We're not, you know, splitting hairs with that. No dude love in the uh, Hell in a Cell. No. When it comes to that. Um, I'd like to hear the argument for Foley over Triple H. Okay. So it is partly, partly due to the synonymous nature of Mick Foley to that match. I think he's part of the most famous iteration of that match in history, which is the obviously the match with Undertaker at King of the Ring 98, not the match with Kane that went to a no contest on Raw. But um, my main argument for putting Mick Foley over Triple H, and it's a roundabout one, so bear with me, <laughs> it's without Hell in a Cell, Mick Foley doesn't become like what we know Mick Foley ends up being which is a multiple-time world champion, one of the top guys in the company, like a huge, I'd say like an unassuming megastar almost because he's someone who really shouldn't, by the way that he looks and the way that he wrestles and just everything about him just doesn't suggest that he should be a world champion and Hell in a Cell changed that because it was that moment that the crowd really started to get behind him, really started to believe in him more than anybody else and that's what really skyrockets him to the top. Then, my argument is that Mick Foley then made Triple H's career. Because without Mick Foley and without that Mick Foley that had been in that Hell in a Cell match, Triple H doesn't become as big a star as he did. I respect it. I even agree with you to an extent. But I still think Triple H is just the more prolific Hell in a Cell guy. He's been in more Hell in a Cell matches. I'm not going to deny that. I don't think he's been in as many good Hell in a Cell matches as Foley has. Well, he's been in more because of the sense that he has been in more. But it's just, I don't think he's percentage. The ratio. Yeah, the ratio. I mean, Foley's been in, has got a, probably a 50% ratio. Because he's had two. What, 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 to be fair, the first Hell in a Cell match is not, by traditional standards, a great match. It's a great spectacle. The match with Triple H is a great match. The other two are forgettable matches that happen on Raw where they just decided, oh, let's just drop the cell, let's see what happens. And the matches with Triple H, I would say the good matches Triple H's had is obviously the match with Foley. I wouldn't say the match with Jericho. Really? I think that's, I think, which just, it, I think to me, it's just a match. Like, it's, it's decent. The most, the most interesting thing that happens in the match is that Tim White is career end. Basically, the most interesting thing, and also they decided for one night to introduce a rule that you can't pin, you have to, you can pin them outside the ring. So that's like, okay, I'll give we'll you just... the the Nash one is middle ground. I like the Michaels one, and I'll I'll allow you to say you know the DX one is kind of meh, and the Legacy one I put it in the middle I, ground I, as well. So, yeah, I would say so. You've got with Triple H stuff. So Foley good. I'm not a fan with the not a huge fan of the joke. I say it's like middle ground. I think the Nash one is. On retrospectively watching it after I originally watched it as like as a kid and thought it was great, but then retrospectively watching it is just like a smoke and mirrors match completely because Nash can't do anything at that point. Um, so that wasn't just the Cody one. I know you're going to say that. So I'm just, <laughs> just going to power right through it. I'm not going to, not going to any attention. I, I expected him to cut you off and just yell, "Wow!" Yeah. <laughs> then um, 
I, I'm not a fan of the match with Michaels because it's too long. It, it's good, but it just it's a bit too blind to smoke up its own arse. What? <laughs> Like, a lot of things that you see on NXT, so surprise, surprise. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so the I, Batista I like, one? Batista one, Batista one is great. I, I like that, that match. A lot. Uh, DX one is just comedy. The Legacy one is good, but it's not, like, super memorable. And then the match with Undertaker is great, but it's, like... Again, it's way too over the top, but it's a, it's a great version of over the top. It, it's... It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the last kind of real Hell in a Cell match, in a way. Yeah, and... Uh... I think that's why I like that one uh, retrospectively because at first you like it just because it's oh, it's Triple H and the Undertaker and they put on a show for you. Then I started to see a lot of people say that that was one where it was just those three guys just you know jerking themselves off, and I never agreed with that. But I can understand in retrospect how that can come across that way. But seeing what we've seen the last seven years or seven Jesus. Last nine years since then, I think that's actually one of the better ones. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm totally fine that the fact that we are going to end up putting Triple H second over Mick Foley. I just feel like there's a there's almost a kinship between Foley and the Hell in a Cell, where they both played like pivotal roles in making them what they are. Yeah, the, the the thing that happened with Foley in that match made the Hell in a Cell seem like the most deadly and violent and destructive structure that WWE had ever come up with. It's the reason why people see it as like one of WWE's most pronounced gimmick matches. And the Hell in a Cell in return, in return for destroying Mick Foley's entire body, <laughs> also gave him the best years of his entire career. If this was a top rip list of the... Actually, you know what? Let's put it this way. Uh... I don't know if we should even classify this as a, a guaranteed thing or something like that, but we might put a little asterisk in this. The Mount Rushmore of Hell in a Cell competitors is Undertaker, Mick Foley, probably Shawn Michaels and Triple H, unless you count, you know, like uh, if this was Hell in a Cell, yes. uh, like the people that made Hell in a Cell, you could bump off Triple H and put Kane in there because of his entrance thing, but I would... I would say Undertaker, Triple H, Foley, and Shawn Michaels. Yeah. You got Taker and Shawn setting up that first match. Taker and Foley doing the next, you know, multiple levels up past that. And Triple H kind of holding down the fort with a lot of other things. And Foley passing that on to Triple H, who has admitted in the past, like, I don't hit this level if it's not for Foley. Foley could have had anybody retire him and he chose me and then he tied it all together with Shawn Michaels who was in Hell in a Cell with two out of the three and even refereed a match with the two out of the three so I think that's fair Mount Rushmore if you uh if you agree on that Callum we have not only determined our top four but we've also determined the Mount Rushmore of this list <laughs> Well, you've already agreed on it, so there's no point in changing it as well. So, oh, I well, mean, no, but it, it's fun if you, you can make the you, you can make the argument that Shawn Michaels shouldn't be the number four. Well, I think right now he has to be, but I feel like if we were to do the Mount Rush, like right now, do the Mount Rushmore, then yeah, it's probably those four. If you wait, I'd say give it three years, and then Shawn Michaels is replaced with either Roman Reigns or Sasha Banks. I'd agree with that statement. That could very well be the thing. Mount Rushmore, as of 2021, before the next uh, LSL pay per view happens. As of May 2021, yeah. Is Shawn Michaels, Triple H, Undertaker, Mick Foley. So look at that. We did both a Mount Rushmore and we're doing a top rope list. We have our. The way that we've mathematically figured this out Undertaker is number one, Triple H is number two, Mick Foley is number three, Shawn Michaels is number four. That means the next highest up that hasn't been accounted for yet is. Callum having Sasha at number four. Now, I've got Sasha at number eight. Rob's got Sasha at number 10. So she is a, a triple for us. So she's not only locked on the list for sure, but she's also locked above number 10 because no matter what, we have uh, only two people have Brock Lesnar. Only one has Kane. Only one has Cena. Only one has Punk. And only one has Angle. So... We know for a fact at this point 
Brock is going to go above Kane, Cena, Angle, and Punk. It's just a matter of does Brock go in the number 10 spot or 9, 8, 7, 6, you know, that kind of thing. Rob wanted Banks higher. I would put Banks higher. I'd you had said before you'd put her seven. above Cena. Yeah, I'd at least put her number seven. So do you want to switch your list where it's uh, no longer Sasha at number 10, that it's Sasha yeah. at number seven? I would put Sasha seven and then bump everybody else down. So then that takes Batista down a spot with that too, which uh, comes into that. But then that means that Sasha's eight, seven, and four. Technically higher up on that list, we've got Randy Orton, five, five, and eight. And then we've got Roman at six, seven, and nine. So I'm thinking it's probably mathematically Orton and then hmm. Then that's tough between Sasha and Roman. So I'd put Sasha right under Roman. I mean right under uh Well or I mean if you if you add them together and get the average, Sasha's ahead of Roman. Yeah. It balances out that way? Yeah, because the Sasha four would be on eleven nineteen. She is above combined. Yeah, she is above with that. So then Sasha and then Roman. And then it becomes Brock, Batista, and question mark, right? Yeah, pretty much. Or are we missing anybody? We got Foley, we got Triple H, we got Michaels, we got Orton, Roman. Okay, so Brock, yeah. Batista, and then whatever. <laughs> well, I, Brock... I think realistically, because Brock's not on your list, it should be Batista next. Yeah, I was going to say, Brock is 6-6 six, six, and 0. And then Batista is 9-9 nine, nine, and 10. Originally it was 9-9 nine, nine, and 9. Actually, originally it was 10-9 nine, and uh, 9. But Batista is the next commonality. So then Batista goes above Brock, and then Brock goes in there for sure because he has 2 out of the um, 2 out of the 3. And then we got the argument about who's number 10. Is it Kane, Punk, Angle, Cena, or a complete other wild card. So I guess the most diplomatic way of doing this is we've got I'm gonna make a separate list here. We got Kane, Punk, Kurt Angle, John Cena. Now my ranking would go Kane Punk and then either Angle or Cena. I think I'd probably go. Actually, you know, I don't know that I'd I'd be swayed between the angle and Cena thing because I didn't see the angle one, and what we're seeing this matches again. Uh, two um, against Orton, that five wide dark match, and the triple threat with Del Rio and Punk. Uh, so then, I mean, without seeing that angle one, I don't know where I'd go with that one. So, at least for my rankings out of that, I'd go Kane. Punk, and then question marks, whatever. If you have to rank those four, how would you rank them, Callum? Kurt Angle, number one. Well, yeah, Kurt, number one. Because he was on your list. So <laughs> that yeah. makes sense. And then... And, and then... and then, I mean, realistically, I'd put about five different names in between then and the next person. Well, if you uh, had to go with those. Uh, probably Kane. And then between Punk and Cena. Punk, I'd say. And then, Rob, yours would be Cena at number one? Um, yeah. Because he was on your list. And then you got Kane, Punk, and Angle. So I'd put... I'd put Kane, Angle, then Punk. So then, based off of that, we got Kane at number one, two, and two. Angle at one, three, and three. Cena at one... Four and four. So then it would be Kane. Mm. Just for the sake of it, at the very least, what were those other names you would have picked instead of those, Callum? Uh, Edge. Jey Uso. Because realistically, he's been in that great tag team match and he had that match with Roman, which is pretty damn good. So I think Jey Uso is a, like, a sneak pick. Uh, Shane McMahon. 
because he's been in three and he's killed himself multiple times in them. And then Becky Lynch. So I feel since I've got Kane at my number seven, we did the math on this one. And I think just because he's got that going on with that entrance, I think Kane at number 10 makes sense. Yeah, I think Kane is more synonymous with the structure than Angle, Cena, or Punk. At this point, that's where you kind of go, all right, if we're talking just one giant list of being synonymous, you got to factor in that entrance. Yeah. Because that debut is something else. Although it does seem like in a couple of years, this list changes for sure. Roman most likely goes higher. Sasha most likely goes. Actually, no, Sasha said that she doesn't ever want to do one of these again, right? I mean, if they tell her that she's going to do it, she's probably going to do it. But I'm pretty sure that she had said that she just like flat out never wants to do them again. And if she doesn't, then she could, you know, be overtaken by Roman Reigns. And Batista's not going to do anymore. Highly doubt that Brock's going to do anymore. Definitely Kane's not going to do anymore. Orton might. Some other people might step up too. It's weird. It's like the end of an era in a way. Like for some people, if we do, uh, if we did um a ladder match list, ours would be like Shawn Michaels and uh, Jericho and all these people that they other people might not have because it's a different era. It's a different. Mm-hmm. Eventually, somebody's gonna be like, "Well, Braun Strowman's a great Hall of Fame competitor," and we're gonna laugh at that. But that's up to them, so that's okay. Yeah, I mean, the people that are on this list that are still on the card in some fashion, we got Bailey, Becky Lynch, Big E, Braun Strowman, Bray Wyatt, Charlotte. Who knows about Daniel Bryan, but I highly doubt it. Um, Dolph Ziggler, I don't think that he'll be in a Hell in a Cell thing anytime soon. Drew McIntyre's only been in one, but he'll probably be in another one. I don't think Edge will be in one, but he could. I think he'll do another one. Jeff finally got to be in one. That was one of the things he wanted to cross off his list. I don't think that Jeff's going to be in another one. I honestly don't think that Jey Uso will, but Jimmy might be in his uh, second one. Or they might be in another tag team Hell in a Cell match or something. You know, I don't know what they would do with that. And I don't think he gets to be in more, you know. You got Kevin Owens, you got Roman, Rollins, Rollins, Banks, Sheamus could potentially be in another one. Probably not Xavier Woods. Although Woods is great. I was really hoping that Woods would answer that challenge for Bobby Lashley. I thought that would have been kind of cool. But so then that makes our list locked in there. We've got not only a Mount Rushmore, but also the top rope list. And from bottom to top, that means our top 10 consolidated WWE Hell in a Cell performers. Number 10 is Kane. Number nine is Brock Lesnar. Number eight is Batista, who we will be checking out in a few days with Army of the Dead. Check that out on fanboysanonymous.com when it comes out. Number seven is Roman Reigns. Number six is Sasha Banks. Number five is Randy Orton. Number four is Shawn Michaels. And he gets into Mount Rushmore territory. Number three is McFoley. Number two is Triple H. And number one is The Undertaker. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. I'm very happy with this list, especially the top half of it. This is my uh, my seal of approval as well that's kind of the whole point of the, we we figure yeah. out what the list is well, yeah. and then we like it because <laughs> if we didn't we would have kept debating <laughs> it's really stupid of me to be like ah, it's good like you know, i'm proud of us we're doing the thing that that was the whole point of this podcast <laughs> yeah but yeah so um i also liked that uh this was kind of a different type of a list too because it was specific uh, specific about Hell in a Cell itself, which means I do want to do the ladder match participants at some point and top rope list of Royal Rumble winners and top rope list of, uh, I don't know, people named Bob. Backlund, probably one of them. Holly, maybe. <laughs> Ashley. Yeah, Bob Lashley. Rude. Rude. <laughs> There's a couple other Bobs out there. <laughs> God, maybe that'll be the next one. If you want to make sure it's the next one, do the pick your poison tier. You know, just be like, do the Bob list. You know, 
now I'm starting to go into the rabbit hole. I'm like, I wonder how many pops we could do on that. I'm like, no, Tony, don't do that. Don't start Robert going Gibson. into. Who was the Bob one? Robert Gibson. <laughs> um, tell us your list. Uh, tell us your Bob oh, list. Um, tell us what other lists that you think that we could do in the future. Uh, maybe we'll do the list of the bulls that I did that with that one. Ask him that got everybody where like, oh, that's not a bull. I'm like, it's. Bull Dempsey and the Brahma Bull, the Rock and El Torito and whatnot. I don't know. We got a lot of variety that we could do here with the top rope list. So tell us your lists. Tell us what you think that our top 10 ended up being. If you think that we should have rearranged some other people, why? You know, any kind of discussion like that. Pick up some merch on T Public and Redbubble. I forgot to mention that. And let's bounce around for some other plugs here. I mentioned before, fanboysanonymous.com is the sister site for here. It's the TBS to the TNT of Smart Out Moment in a lot of ways. <laughs> Talk about that on the hot tags. And one of the things that we do on there is the fan tracks, which is the same thing as the fan outs table, except for it just happens to be movies and TV show episodes and stuff. So one of our next things we have on the schedule is the Army of the Dead film. We will be watching that and doing our uh, first reactions for that on Friday or Saturday or so. I don't remember exactly when it comes out. It's the 21st, so it's coming out either like 3 in the morning or something, and we'll do that in the afternoon, or we'll do it on like Saturday or something. I don't know. We'll figure it out. But that'll happen, so check out fanboysanonymous.com and check out all the stuff that we have going on there. You can follow me at Tony Mango all over the place. I am also potentially going to be starting something up on Substack. I haven't quite figured that out yet, but... That came out of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, kind of one of those things where I was just like, you know what, maybe I'll sign up for that. And I don't know what I'm going to do for it yet. Usually I have an idea before I start doing those things instead of just like, I'll make an account. So I might do some just blah, 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 whatever type stuff on there. I don't know. If you have anything in particular you want to see me do on that kind of a platform, then let me know. And follow what these guys have going on as well. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter and everywhere at Duke Felice. Check out everything I got going on at Fightful.com, WrestleZone.com, and of course, Market Moment and Fanboys Anonymous. You can check out, um, well, this is actually getting released at the same time. So yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping to be doing Twitch by June. And uh, yeah, just in, enjoy that ride with me, join in on that ride. and. I'll have more on that eventually. And I'm going to pass you over to Callum Wiggins. Yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter at Wigmeister14 and check out smartcutmoment.com to uh, read all the weekly articles, including the power rankings, my week-to-week -week contribution. And you can follow the Fantasy League there as well. Uh, spoiler, Rob's losing. Uh, <laughs> but Rob, the point. That's not just a spoiler. That's not, that's not a prediction, that's a spoiler. But, uh, and... Other than that, of course, you can check out if you want, want to dip back into the uh, Smarker Moment archives and listen to some retro podcasts. There's always 2001 Wrestling Odyssey and the Paul Hammond's Fat Dank podcast. The best thing about that is because it's retro content. It never goes out of date. So just check all that stuff out as well. And yeah, that's it for me. So the next time you guys are going to be hearing from us is going to be the hot tags where we're going to talk about all these releases that are happening today. We got um, at least like five or six of them, and some of them I'm actually kind of surprised about, including somebody who just never popped up in WWE other than on a, in a hot tub. Just a shame. And the other hot tags that we have going on, that'll be popping up about like the TNT situation and the Miz getting injured and whatever else happens over the next two days. We'll do that on Friday night. You'll be able to hear that early Friday morning. Then over the weekend, at some point, yeah, whether it's Monday or whatever it might be, we're going to record another episode of A Review to a Kill, our James Bond series. We'll be doing Casino Royale, and that'll come out four weeks after we record that. That's why Rob was re referencing the whole, like, when's this coming out kind of a thing, because when we record that, sometimes it's a little bit hard for us to be like, all right, we're recording this on, like, May 18th, and it's going to be coming out in June something or other, so we don't know what we're up to yet. But the next episode of that is actually going to be popping up on Friday morning here, which is going to be, if I remember correctly, Goldeneye. One of the ones that if you are, you want to make sure you set aside a couple of hours to listen to me be like, the sound effects on this are great and everything. 
then um, that's happening before the hot tags. And then next week we will get into, after we do the next episode of a review to a kill, our double or nothing predictions. We're going to roll along after that, get through June, do the normal stuff until we get to the point of hell in a cell. And then by the time hell in a cell 2021 comes around, we'll do the pay-per-view point stuff, break down the predictions and the results for that one. So thank you for listening to this. Thank you for all your support. Hopefully you had quite a bit of fun. I know that we did. And we will see you when we see you, everybody. But for now, this has been another Smart Out moment. And we're being counted out.